This right here is every animated film created by Disney. As you can see, it's a lot. Over the course of Your Everyday Nerd, I'll be taking a look at all of them individually. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's organize them real quick. This is the Disney animated film era's timeline. It showcases all 59 theatrically released films in a more digestible format. In this episode, we'll be setting up exactly what these eras are and then reviewing every movie in the golden age. So sit back, relax, and welcome to Your Everyday Nerd. Is she doing the renegade? A little soldier boy, perhaps? Maybe the stanky, I don't know, we'll, we'll never know. Are you an everyday nerd? Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next episode. Yo, welcome back to Your Everyday Nerd. I'm your host, Zack Snyder. If you're new around here on Yen, we pull from every corner of nerd culture to talk about anything and everything that piques my interest. Much like most people, I grew up with Disney animated films. In fact, I'd argue that Disney animation is a staple of modern pop culture. Sure, they may not be making the best decisions recently. That, that Mulan remake was, was pretty garbage. But when you dig into film history and you see just how much Walt Disney and his studio did for the industry, it's really no surprise that Disney holds such a massive presence in the contemporary entertainment landscape. If you don't know anything about it, the Walt Disney Company was founded in 1923 under two brothers, Walt and Roy Disney. Only 22 years old at the time, Walt started his career working on animated shorts. This was still very early in film history, so a lot of these were silent shorts, including Alice Comedies, which was based off of the Alice in Wonderland story by Lewis Carroll, and Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, who was the first Disney character to have an actual personality. We're talking about black and white cartoons with very little detail, where the actual source of entertainment is in its comics. Now, Disney could have just rode this train for a while, and he tried to, but since Oswald was owned by Universal Pictures at the time, Disney couldn't do much of this character on his own terms. This event brought the ever so popular Mickey Mouse to life. 1928 Steamboat Willie, the first Disney animated short with sound, was a huge hit and would be just the beginning of Mickey Mouse's legacy. Around this time, it's also crucial to bring up Silly Symphonies, a series of shorts that were characterized by comedic gags accompanied by music. A lot of these would end up receiving Academy Awards and nominations, but at the end of the day, they were more of a blueprint to success for Warner Brothers, who would end up creating Merry Melodies, which turned into the famous Looney Tunes. What you got? I mention this because it's obvious that Disney's early ventures were not for him in his studio, rather they were for the entire animation landscape as a whole. All of these shorts ended up setting the stage for the very ambitious, now 33-year-old Walt Disney who decided he wanted to create a feature-length animated film. This began the golden age of Disney. I it's your favorite Disney movie of all time. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. About a year ago, I did a full episode on this film and my conclusion was simply, it's fine. Like I get why it's important culturally, but overall it just didn't hit me as hard as it does everybody else. And in many ways, I still kind of feel that way. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs doesn't have a whole lot in terms of its story. Snow White, a young princess, runs away from home after her evil stepmother threatens to kill her because a magic mirror said that Snow White was much prettier than her. This story is based off of a Grimm's fairy tale from 1812, and while the story is fairly similar, there are a few key differences. For instance, after the Huntsman is hired to kill Snow White, instead of coming back empty-handed, in the original story, he returns with the heart of a wild animal for which the queen decides to eat. So that's, that's neat. Also, instead of the queen dying in this very epic way on a cliff in a storm, in the story, she's ordered by the prince to wear hot iron slippers and dance to death. Was she doing the renegade? A little soldier boy, perhaps? Maybe the stanky, I don't know, we'll, we'll never know. But one of the biggest changes that Disney brings to the film adaptation, and one of the reasons why I kind of do like this movie, is that instead of the mere existence of seven dwarfs like there are in the book, they actually give unique names and personalities to all of the dwarfs. Each of the dwarfs have their own individual walking animations. Seeing Dopey in the back of the line, skipping behind, is charming. Doc's ability to stutter, yet correct himself every time he messes up, is endearing. And I absolutely love Grumpy's arc. 
where at first he's just this misogynistic asshole who doesn't want anything to do with Snow White. Women. But eventually it's Grumpy who is hit the hardest when she is poisoned by the apple. Now I will say, this is a bit of a double-edged sword. It can be a bit frustrating that so much of this film is with the dwarfs. As much as I do enjoy the amount of effort put into their characters, and at times, I do enjoy the small gags that are implemented in the film, in this early Disney era, one of the driving forces behind the comedic value in these films were in its gags. They would even pay the animators extra money if their gags made it into the finished product. With all this said, my biggest problem with the seven dwarfs is that they have an entire scene dedicated to washing your hands. We ain't going to do it, are we? Well, it, 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 it'll please the princess. Now, as relevant as this is today, please do go wash your hands before watching your everyday nerd. I just personally don't care to see seven grown men singing about washing their filthy hands. In fact, as preparation for this video, I watched all of the bonus features on my Blu-rays, including the entire commentary track, and multiple times there are mentions of Walt Disney removing parts of the film that took away from the pacing of the story, and yet, somehow, some way, by some miracle, he still allowed this washing your hands scene to stay in the film. I just don't get it. With all this being said, compared to some of the later Disney films where the sidekick characters take up so much of the screen time, I would much rather spend more time with Doc and the gang rather than the bumbling idiot fairies in Sleeping Beauty or the annoying mice in Cinderella. So all this to say that the dwarfs are both a negative and a positive in my book. Speaking of side characters though, this is a film that unconsciously created the entire Disney formula. I don't think it perfected it, but Snow White is the first Disney princess. We have the first scenes with cute animals. One of those cute animals, by the way, is this stupid little turtle who is so oblivious to everything going on around him and that just makes me love him so much more. There's the fact that some of the songs are catchy and they're advancing the plot at the same time. It's just so impressive to me that so much of what makes a Disney film a Disney film started at the very beginning. When it does come to the story of Snow White, I do enjoy it enough. It's clearly not amazing, but it is paced better than the original Grimm's fairy tale. In the film, we mainly get the conflict parts throughout the first 10 minutes and the last 10 minutes. And while I would have preferred to spend a bit more time with the queen and the prince to flesh out these main characters, the original story just kind of spins its wheels, having Snow White constantly be tricked by the queen, only to finally get poisoned by the apple at the end. Speaking of the queen, she is horrifying. And there's something about these early Disney films that just goes to some very dark places. And I'm impressed that they do it so well without ever sacrificing the overall lighter tone of the film. The queen's transformation into a horrid old hag is not only spooky, but the special effects are awesome to look at. Also, Snow White as a character, she isn't that great, but as a first Disney princess, I feel like it's more solid than I gave credit originally. She has some wit to her. She's caring. What's the matter? And she's the blueprint for a lot of traits that future Disney princesses would end up following. I will say though that I am annoyed by her voice. While sure, Snow White's voice is super unique, it, it, it's also exceptionally dated and I don't like listening to it at all. Of course, the main reason you're gonna to wanna to watch the first Disney film is to see how fantastically amazing this animation is. Every frame in this film is its own painting. The backgrounds, the animals, everything is so beautiful. Well, well, except for Snow White and the Prince. Around this time, Disney used rotoscoping to animate these characters. In other words, they took footage of real people performing certain actions and then traced over it so that those actions would look as lifelike as possible. They somewhat look out of place compared to everything else. It's a nitpick, I know, but when the Seven Dwarfs are as cartoony as they are, Snow White just looks strangely out of place to me. At the end of the day, Snow White is still super impressive because of its production. This is not just a milestone in art, but it's also a milestone in technology. There was so much money poured into this thing. New cameras and lenses were created entirely for this film specifically. This isn't even close to being one of my favorite Disney films music wise, but I can't argue that there are some bops. But I will say for a film that people thought was going to tank, 
nicknaming it Disney's Folly before it even came out, for a film that had corrections and fixes all the way to a few days before it officially premiered, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is undoubtedly a cinematic achievement. I may not personally care for it as much as some of the other films in the golden era, and especially compared to later Disney films, but it is still certainly worth watching today, especially if you're like me and you care about film history. Pinocchio. When you wish upon a star. I absolutely adore this film. 1940s Pinocchio came out at a time where Walt Disney was trying to figure out what was going to top Snow White. The studio had already started working on multiple films, including Bambi, Alice in Wonderland, and Wind in the Willows, all of which ended up coming later on in their own projects. When they realized that each of those projects had some issues that were going to take way more time and resources, Pinocchio ended up being the next one on the docket. This isn't to say that it too didn't have issues. I mean, Disney owed a lot of money to the bank, World War II had just started and troops were being sent to live at the studio for a while. Disney was also asked to make a documentary about airplanes for the US government, which I'll talk about in the next Disney video. Long story short, while the company was trying to one-up their previous impossible achievement, they ended up with a ton of new obstacles, and yet, Pinocchio is still the cream of the crop when it comes to animated films. Adapted from The Adventures of Pinocchio, a serialized story by Carlo Collati that was published weekly in one of the first Italian children's magazines, Pinocchio does what every great adaptation strives to do, be faithful to the source material while still being its own thing. The story of course follows Pinocchio, a puppet who magically comes to life after a toy maker named Geppetto carved him out of wood. The Disney story is focused on the naivety of this child who was literally just born yesterday as he makes his way through a gauntlet of episodic misadventures. The original story, however, showcases Pinocchio in an awful light where he deserves all the misfortune that comes his way because he just so happens to be a little bitch. In the Disney film, the first character that we're introduced to is Jiminy Cricket, a singing, talking, wisecracking cricket who is appointed to Pinocchio as his conscience. As the film goes on, we see Jiminy on these misadventures with Pinocchio. He helps the situation sometimes. He fuels the situation other times. He's kind of like a parental figure, but like not a very good one. But in the Kaladi story, Jiminy doesn't make it past chapter four. That's because after Jiminy tells Pinocchio to stop being a little <laughs> Pinocchio just picks up a big hammer and smashes Jiminy Cricket, <laughs> killing him. Well, can't please everybody. So obviously Disney couldn't adapt everything from the original story here. It's a weird angle that showcases the brilliance on Walt Disney's part for not only creating a fantastic film here, but something that's always been a big strength of the Disney studio, creating an adaptation that still has a lot of that original intent while adding that Disney charm. So we talked about how the original story was episodic in nature since it did run in a magazine. Wildly enough, in this film, we still get that episodic adventure. After the first 20 minutes of the movie, which is a little slow, but I do love it on a technical level. There's a lot of really dope sound design happening with all these toys and clocks. The animation again, super impressive. But it's at this point that the episodic nature of the story truly takes form with Pinocchio's multiple villains. Welcome back to me, that baddie. This is the show where you get to pick which baddie is the real baddie of the bunch. Today on Meet That Baddie, we have contestant number one, Meet Stromboli. He's 270 pounds of ravioli, ravioli, what's in the pocket totally? Do you like a man who fantasizes with puppets in his spare time? How about a relationship with no strings attached? If so, then Stromboli is your guy. Contestant number two, let's meet the Coachman. Head on down to Pleasure Island where the Coachman will give you all the booze, cigars, and games you could ever want. But be careful, if you're a bad boy, you'll end up looking like a jackass. Hee haw, hee haw, hee haw. Contestant number three, come on down. With Monstro, you'll have a well of a time. Are you into Vor? Cause Monstro will make sure your wildest fantasies come true. So which one do you want? Let me know down in the comments and your wildest desires will come to you. So the wild thing about this film is that none of the villains are campy or cheesy or ha ha he a funny bad guy. No, they're all legitimately frightening and disturbing. I talked about the dark themes in Snow White, 
Well, Pinocchio one-ups those dark themes. We have kidnapping, slave labor, horrifying boy to donkey transformations, and then there's just a whale that eats everybody out of nowhere for no reason. These crazy moments are what I love about Pinocchio. It takes a lot of risks. It goes really dark without trying to explain anything. And while there is a happy ending, Pinocchio does become a real boy and he is reunited with his father Geppetto, it's kind of unsettling to know that there's an entire species of donkeys running around that used to be children. It's not okay. At the end of the day, I think Pinocchio takes the cake for my favorite golden era film. I love the soundtrack. Not only is When You Wish Upon a Star iconic, but the actual score is a masterpiece on its own. I love the story. It's the most wacky of the golden age films. And it's not just a great animated film, but a great film in general. When you look at the way they simulated camera movement, there's this one scene where the camera is panning and zooming into the city way before computers. It's just wild that that took them days just to film this scene, let alone animate it. I just feel like for every good thing that Snow White does and the reasons why it goes on these top 100 lists and people say it's one of the greatest films of all time, like all those things could be moved on to Pinocchio because, because Pinocchio does it 10 times better. Fantasia! Fantasia. One of the things that's admirable about early Disney is that Walt didn't want to just make films for kids. He wanted to create art. He would actually take time to show great films to his animators, bring in famous big name composers and artists. I found out that he even worked with Spanish painter Salvador Dali on a short called Destino, but it's crazy because I think you really could put Walt Disney right up there beside someone as prolific as Salvador Dali as one of the best artists of all time. While Snow White was undoubtedly a huge success, Pinocchio didn't do too hot in the box office. So Disney wanted to try something different here. Fantasia isn't your typical narrative-driven film. Instead, we have eight separate animated shorts, each with different themes and ideas, all set to popular classical music. For film lovers, the big selling point for Fantasia is that you're watching art. For everybody else, the big selling point for Fantasia is that it has Mickey Mouse. Like I said earlier, Mickey Mouse started gaining popularity after Steamboat Willie, so Disney would continue to use this character in his own shorts, but every once in a while Mickey would make an appearance in a bigger project, like Fantasia. Here, he plays the main character in one of the shorts, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, where he runs around and attempts to do magic. While Fantasia definitely knocks the lid off of the possibilities of animation, it also didn't do well in the box office either, and unfortunately we don't even get a sequel until 2000, and then that one also didn't do too well. So it's really no wonder why the studio doesn't exactly take risks anymore. Even if I argue that making really good art is worth the risk, especially if you're a billion dollar company, and unfortunately we do live in, in a capitalist nation, so uh, they, they, don't, they don't care. They just want that money. All of that aside, I really love this film. There's a couple of things that I don't quite care for. They do format Fantasia as a concert. So there's this entire intermission where they try to introduce you to the orchestra. I get why they do it, but it's just really cheesy and super outdated. The shorts though, nothing short of amazing. So let's go through them right quick. I'm gonna rank all eight of them from least favorite to favorite. Mind you, none of them are bad. They're all good, but my bottom is gonna be my least favorite. Dance of the Hours is a ballet split into four different sections. There's the ostriches, the hippos, the elephants, and the alligators. They all come together at the end, and while I do enjoy the music, I just simply do not care about dancing animals. It's not bad, it's just easily my least favorite. Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony combined with a pastel-filled Greek mythology world is near perfect. These colors beautifully complement the music. The character designs are cute and fit that old Disney style well. But then they start bringing the Greek gods into play and things just get a little out of control for me and I just lose interest. Sure, the climax in the music needed a climax in the animation, but compared to the more grandiose sections in some of the other shorts, it just spells in comparison. Oh, also there's like an incredibly racist thing in this originally. I'm not gonna put it on the screen because it was extremely uncalled for. But I at least had to mention it because Disney has had a strange, strange history of being racist. I'm sure we'll talk about that more in the future. 
While narratively, it has a lot to be desired, I think making Takata and Fugue the introduction to Fantasia was the best choice for settling the audience into what this film is all about. This classic Bach piece is mostly abstract, featuring bits with the orchestra and silhouettes at first, and then going into an expressionistic sequence where the visuals are basically simulating the music's audio waves. It really does put you in a trance. Either way, epic short, not much to it, but I still like it. While it doesn't crack my top three, the Nutcracker Suite is arguably the best audio to visual transformation of this Tchaikovsky ballet. It's not another Christmas version, and that is one of its biggest strengths, because so many Nutcracker films try to lean into the narrative more than representing the music in a unique way. I don't want to get into a tangent, but the 2018 Disney live-action Nutcracker movie is everything I didn't want in this ballet. So I'm very much looking forward to revisiting this short many times in the future. I love the little mushrooms vibing to the Chinese dance. I love the snow fairies and the snowflakes. They're actually real life props that they had placed on gears and film to make it appear 3D. I love the dew drops on the spider webs. It's all just really comforting and nice and it blows Barbie and the Nutcracker out of the water. Stravinsky's Ride of Spring is a classic in the orchestra repertoire, so for it to fit so naturally with a segment about dinosaurs is both impressive as hell and really freaking awesome. We see a lot of Earth's early years in this short, from the planet's formation to the extinction of the dinosaurs. My favorite part by far is when a T-Rex and a Stegosaurus fight each other to the death. I may be in my 20s, but it turns out that dinosaurs are still really freaking epic. By the way, the older you get, the less you're asked the question, what is your favorite dinosaur? Mine is Ankylosaurus, so if you just want to leave in the comments, let me know what your favorite is. I'd love to hear it, honestly. I actually had the opportunity to play the Sorcerer's Apprentice in my college orchestra a few years back. It's still one of my favorite orchestral pieces to date. So to see it brought to life by Disney is still such a fun experience. This one is the most popular for a few reasons. I think the main one is since this piece was based on a poem, it does have a narrative, which makes it a lot more easier to follow than some of the more impressionistic shorts. I don't have much to say about this one. It's just simply fun. I love Mickey Mouse running around trying to fix his dumbass mistake. Yin said in his disappointing eyebrow is apparently a nod to Walt Disney's look whenever he was disappointed in the studio. And as always, the animation here is just absolutely stunning. But by far, my favorite part of Fantasia is the conclusion. The juxtaposition between the utterly bombastic demon Chernabog causing chaos in Night on Bald Mountain and the serene emotional relief of Ave Marie is something I wish I could experience for the first time again. It's not only technically impressive, but really, really dope. I love it so much. It's such an awesome part of Disney history, and it really makes for an unironically epic conclusion to this film. When it comes to Fantasia as a whole, it's really inspiring to see that Disney had a particular vision for this film. He set out and he conquered it. It's freaking great. Again, I wish there were more of these. Eventually we'll get to Fantasia 2000 where they try to get and uh, <laughs> damn old capitalism, bro. Just let the art be made. Either way, Fantasia is 100% worth your time and I absolutely recommend watching it. The Reluctant Dragon. Pardon me, Mr. Bensley. This is your score, Doris. I've got all the cues marked in. I think you come in right after the fourth beat there, okay? Okay, Frank. Let's give it a lot of personality now. An oddball in the Disney Golden Era canon is 1941's The Reluctant Dragon. Instead of putting out another full-length animated feature due to an animator strike, The Reluctant Dragon starts a live-action tour of the Walt Disney Studio with the eyes of radio comedian Robert Benchley. Throughout its 1 hour and 13 minute runtime, we get to see an, albeit probably fabricated, behind-the-scenes look at many of the aspects needed to create an animated film. Everything from a voice recording session with the voice of Donald Duck, Foley session featuring the Casey Jr. segment from Dumbo. A camera room session which demonstrates the fascinating multi-plane camera along with many other bits 
that are pretty interesting to watch. Scattered throughout the film, we also get these animated shorts, making this technically a Disney animated film. One of these segments is called Baby Weems, which is less animation and more storyboarding. They show off a story reel about this baby genius. It's cute, but not all that special. It's just more interesting to see the storyboard images than to get the plot of the actual story here. We also have a Goofy cartoon, Gorge. which is the very first of many how-to Goofy shorts. But the biggest animated presentation here is the story, The Reluctant Dragon. The entire premise behind this film is that Robert Benchley is chilling in a pool with his wife. She's been reading this children's book called The Reluctant Dragon. She thinks it'd be great for a Disney film. So she calls up the Disney studio, sets up a meeting with Walt, and sends her husband out to go present the book to him. Meanwhile, the biggest gag of the movie is that while we're taking this tour on the studio, somehow, some way, everybody in the studio knows Mr. Benchley. In fact, the only reason he's able to get around the studio and get this tour is because he's been avoiding having this meeting with Walt. So throughout the runtime, he goes through different doors, we see different parts of the studio, and then at the end, he finally meets Walt when they sit down to watch an animated short. And lo and behold, Disney was ahead of Benchley the whole time, and they already made the dang dragon cartoon. This cartoon itself is honestly quite amusing. It's a lot better than some of the shorts that would end up being in the package films coming up in the wartime era, but it's just a simple little story about a town that's afraid of a dragon. So they send a knight to go fight the dragon, but the dragon is a poet and the knight is also a poet, so they end up becoming friends. It's actually kind of like the plot to Shark Tale, the more I think about it. So uh, that's, that's really crazy. Overall, The Reluctant Dragon, nothing amazing, but I do like it for what it is. I like seeing some of the behind the scenes things, and this is a really cool look at the Disney studio. It's also got some pretty comedic moments. There's this assistant character that's supposed to get Mr. Benchley to his meeting with Walt Disney, and he just keeps getting cucked multiple times. Obviously though, this isn't a narrative film or anything. It's more of a documentary than a movie. You probably could just watch the behind the scenes sections if you wanted to, or if you just wanna watch the animated sections, I'm sure you could do that too. Either way, I enjoyed it. It's not gonna to top the list or anything, but it was a surprisingly good time. Ha <laughs> ha, Dumbo. With the last three films in the Disney repertoire losing them money, it's no surprise that they took a step back and made a cute little film about an elephant that could fly. <music> 1940s Dumbo is like taking a bedtime storybook and perfectly translating it to film. In fact, the original Dumbo story was created for this toy called the Rollo Book. Think of a PDF document printed out on a scroll that you could place in this device so that instead of turning pages, you would just roll through the book. As far as I know, it wasn't publicly produced, but the story by Helen Aberson and Harold Pearl was adapted into the film that we know of today. Again, Dumbo is incredibly simple. It's about a newborn elephant who is picked on because he has big ears. He ends up getting separated from his mother. He's forced to do some stupid tricks at a circus. It's very depressing. But by the end of the movie, he's not only come to terms with who he is, thanks to his new friend, Timothy the Mouse, but he also learns, hey, he can fly. It's hard to talk about this film for too long because it doesn't have the oomph or the pizzazz that Snow White or Pinocchio had. It doesn't have any of the depth or the class that Fantasia has, but it also never feels like it's missing anything. There's a reason why Dumbo did so well. It spoke to audiences of all ages. It's heart-wrenching when baby Dumbo is taken from his mother. It's exciting when Dumbo learns how to fly. Of course, there's a couple of things that haven't aged super well. The crows are racial stereotypes at the time. I also feel like Dumbo is the most forgettable of the bunch. Like it's really short, only 64 minutes long. So it goes by quicker than I would like. Apparently there was a deleted scene about why elephants were scared of mice. I think that would have been cool if it had stayed in there, but it's fine. The thing that I love about this film though, and the reason it goes just a little bit higher on the scoreboard for me, is the pink elephant scene. So at one point in the film, Timothy the mouse takes Dumbo to go see his imprisoned mother. And on the way back, Dumbo needs something to drink. So Timothy finds a bucket of water for him. Unfortunately though, it was not a bucket of water and instead was a bucket of champagne. So the mouse and the elephant get drunk and it do be kind of funny though. But it's also like really, really dope 
because we get to see a bunch of dolly like surrealist pink elephants doing wild and stuff and it's just visually stimulating it's one of those things that would absolutely make a top 10 animated sequences of disney films if if i was making a watch mojo video with all that said dumbo is definitely a classic it's not something that i personally love as much as some people but i could definitely see myself returning to this in the future Sotheby, cancel my dinner with the president. We've got business with an elephant. Oh boy, we're, we're gonna have to talk about it for a second, aren't we? So as I go through these Disney films, it's very clear that in the future, we're gonna be talking about a lot of these remakes. And I don't know if I'll have much to say about them as a whole, but uh, D Dumbo 2019, that one is, it's definitely bad. Most of it is just boring and uninspiring, but it's, I'm just very confused. Like who was this made for? So I haven't heard of many Dumbo stands out there, but yeah, yeah, this exists. The biggest thing that causes confusion for me is the fact that Dumbo 1941 is an hour and four minutes, while Dumbo 2019 is an hour and 52 minutes. Now you might be wondering, where are they getting that extra 48 minutes from? Well, considering that certain things from the original are completely removed, like the racist crows, makes sense. Timothy the mouse makes less sense i don't know most of the movie ends up following this human cast of characters including danny devito circus man which is fine i guess danny devito funny michael keaton bad guy which is less fine why did he take this role did he have nothing else to do and colin farrell and family who just i don't know they're just like a boring family who wasted my time by talking instead of letting me see elephant fly with his big floppy ears these children actors are bad the plot has got so much added on nonsense it's not even funny the big emotional moment of the original is when dumbo gets to see his imprisoned mother for a brief moment and this beautiful song baby mine plays it's really really sad seeing all these happy animals juxtaposed with dumbo and his mother super depressing in the remake this song plays about 25 minutes into the movie and, and it did nothing to my emotions. I just sat there and stared. Anyways, I'm just gonna forget about it now. Wow, this is a disaster. Bambi! Walt Disney, the world's greatest storyteller, brings the world's greatest love story to the screen. 1942's Bambi is just pure comfort food for me. Unlike Dumbo and more in vain of the first couple of Disney features, Bambi is another cinematic achievement. If you told me that Bambi was your favorite Disney film, I'd believe you. The core of this film's soul is in its realistic depiction of wildlife. They brought real deer and rabbits and other animals into the animator's studios so that every little moment you saw on screen was as realistic as possible. It's a little weird thinking of photorealism in Disney in current year because of things like the live action Dumbo or Lion King, but the difference between this modern CGI realism and the hand-drawn animated realism is that you can tell that Bampi and Thumper are still cartoon characters in this movie. Timon and Pumbaa look like documentary footage in the most unflattering way possible, and again, like this is another movie, I just don't understand why it was made. There's an attention to detail in Bambi that's almost unrivaled by a lot of the later Disney films. The impressionistic backgrounds, the anatomically correct movements. In many ways, since this is the end of the golden age, there's almost something lost to later films. Disney had to get safer with their projects. Everything wasn't quite an experiment anymore. Plus, the next group of films, the wartime era, had a significant drop in budget. So I say all this just to put in perspective how important Bambi is, even though it's the last movie we're talking about today. I briefly mentioned The Lion King and mostly just so I could trash talk about the remake, but a lot of people consider Bambi to be the blueprint to the original Lion King. Both are coming of age films about a young prince in their natural habitat. Now, The Lion King goes a bit more into the Shakespearean Hamlet approach, where you're like, yeah, it's a tragedy, bro. They put in all the tragedy in your face. Bambi, it's a bit more subtle in its tragedy. This is also, without a doubt, the most mature of the Golden Age. Don't get me wrong. There are some silly moments. What did your father tell you? About what? About eating the blossoms and leaving the greens. Oh, that one. But all of these moments are just that. They're moments. This is a coming of age film. 
We see the entire life of Bambi from his wobbly days of being an infant to the moment where he has his own kid. Each of the characters are represented in somewhat cartoonish ways. For the most part, everything that they do is very in their nature. We don't question why Bambi has a missing father for part of the film. It's just assumed that that's what Mel Deers do. And when Bambi's mother dies, it's again heartbreaking, but not in a vying for your attention kind of way, simply just another part of nature. Also, while Bambi is the least musical of this group of films, only having one memorable song in Little April Shower, it easily has my favorite score of the group. The atmosphere of the forest is paired beautifully with this whimsical soundtrack. So I'll leave it at that. Bambi is a masterpiece. I don't love this movie as much as Pinocchio. I'm sure a couple of other later Disney movies will top it for me. There's no doubt in my mind this is a film you absolutely should watch if you haven't seen it already. So that's the golden age of Disney, 1937 to 1942. I don't want to go into these next Disney episodes negatively because some of my favorite films of all time are in different eras, but it is going to be sad to leave the golden era. It's such a special part of film history and I'm really glad I got to put them under a microscope instead of just remembering them as films I watched when I was a kid. But that's all the time we have left for today. If you liked the video, go and give it a like. If for one reason you didn't like it, I guess you can hit the dislike button. Let me know down in the comments, what are your favorite Disney movies? There's a lot of them that I really, really love and I'm excited to talk about them in the coming months. Let me know what you're looking forward to. Let me know what you enjoy. Go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. And I thank you so much for watching this episode again. Until next time, hope you guys have a great day. Goodbye.